Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to occur uh, to one when one goes off on this endeavor of <laughs> communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Dros. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Uh, hello, I am Rob and I do user experience design and I make interactive experiences and I coach and teach about all that stuff. Good to see you again, Rob. Good to see you, Jersey. Kind of, yeah. Uh, it's always fun. Always fun to, to do that thing that you, you sell right in the beginning. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's what we keep, keep showing up for over 300 episodes at this point. Uh, just exploring the things that we're we're making and the situations and and the, the lifestyle surrounding it and you know you just it's there's so many uh, places to go right including the, the 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 premise the thing we kicked off this whole podcast about about being teachers and being teachers. Um, and also students. And also students. And and for those who are new to the show, if you're tuning in for the first time, we usually just try to pick a single topic and then we, you know, think about it as thoroughly as we can with about an hour and change. And in the first half of the show, we talk about what it looks like. And then the second half of the show, we talk about how we think about it. We recently instituted a new segment of the show called the two minute practice, which we'll talk about in the third segment of the show now. Um, but the topics are often informed by stuff that's happening in our lives at the time. We try to pick things that are like, what are we noticing? Um, one of the things that we talk about a lot in the show is this idea of like the analytic eye, always keeping that eye open. And when something moves you, when you feel something, when you notice something, when something arrests you, maybe even like just like aesthetically, uh, stop and ask why. Why did it do that? And uh, so we're always on the hunt. We're always like looking around us to say like, what's happening around me right now? And not necessarily, I wouldn't call it like an urgent way of looking for material for the show, but we're always alert for something that could be what they call in teaching a teachable moment, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, it can seem probably unappealing. I could, I could, I can understand that, right? But like for me, it's this excitement of, uh, well, it's, I guess I'm always, you know, swinging my butterfly net around trying to catch those little, you know, beautiful ideas and moments and then uh, share it. But, you know, not in a way that sort of, you know, murders a butterfly, I guess. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, the ideas, thankfully, can uh, be, get passed around without hurting any, any butterflies. So. Right, that's, right. Like one of the things. And that's so I the did... excitement. You feel like you did that thing and like you get this extra bonus for that discovery. Of, of just yeah. sharing it. Something that I, I recently instituted, re recently as in in the last couple of years, I've instituted in my classrooms is the first week of class, I have the kids, I teach a lot of youth classes, like ages like nine to 12, had the kids sit in a semicircle and I crisscross applesauce on the floor, I sit in the middle and I say, you know, like the cartooning world's a very small world, we all know each other and in order to be a good professional, we have to uh, adhere to certain standards, certain rules of behavior, codes of conduct, because if you're a jerk, words gets around fast, so what are those codes of conduct? You know, and the one thing I say is like, um, we build each other up, we don't tear each other down. Um, if we, it, it's awesome to, to have a question. It's awesome to not know something. Why? Because that means you get to learn something because the, the whole point of this thing is to constantly be leveling up and exploring. And if you run out of stuff to learn, that sucks. That's going to make the job a lot more boring. And the third rule is, um, if, if help is asked and you have the, if you know how to help offer help, um, so, but that second point is like the one that I have a lot of trouble making like 11 year olds understand is like, it's super cool to not know something, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, different, different stages of development. I mean, are, are funny. I mean, our, our brains are this evolving thing. And at some, some points in our, in our lifespans, they're just, I guess some ideas are, 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 are harder to grasp. I mean, anything from like, super tiny brains and object permanence to then trying to integrate how you have, you know, like a rational ability and also your feelings and they all matter and how do you integrate them? And as you're your middle, you know, early kiddo and all that's, and yeah, it, it just, it, it keeps going, but where, you know, and, and getting super concrete or having diff, diff, different strengths or different neuro uh, circumstance, right? Where mm -hmm. some folks are already super concrete at an early, early age or all this stuff. And anyway, it's just when you, when you provide an, a learning experience and that's your, 
uh, that's your role. That's your fortunate situation that you're in. It's it's like you you get to, uh, I guess, well, figure out how to generally bring everyone through this overall experience, but then individually, there could be all sorts of um, adjustment and uh, responding to, to different needs and, and whatnot too. Mm -hmm. Which could happen to be like the entire class if everyone's a certain age where they're like, yeah, uh, failing actually sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and wait a second, Saturday teacher, when we're in school every day this week, we're told that there's like pass and fail. You know, don't tell us that it's not cool or that it's awesome <laughs> to know, not know something because I get these letter marks on my paper that says you didn't know this fail. Yeah, I, I know what I'm up against. But, but that's all to say that. You know, this this that's how this topic came around this week is that um, there's some stuff happening in my life right now that is making me very aware of the fact that um, there is a lot of work that I take for granted now when I'm developing workshop experiences for students that um, maybe isn't as obvious to people who don't do it that often or are doing it for the first time. In other words, how do you unpack what you do to turn it into a workshop? or some kind of program or event? Uh, and how do you document that so that you can clearly d communicate that to another organization to build trust that they will hire you to do these things? Why is this coming up in my life? Well, right now, the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival uh, table applications are open. And they're open till the end of this month, February 28th. So if you want to apply for a free table at A2CAF, A2CAF.com slash apply, you can apply for a table there. But I am working as uh, the programming coordinator for this festival and have been for the last 11 years. And part of my job is to go through the applicants and invite people uh, to say like, hey, you know, um, one of the questions on the applications, like, would you like to lead a workshop? And the people who say yes, I reach out to them and say, okay, you want to do a workshop? Let's talk about what kind of workshop you want to do, right? And uh, so it's it's very high in my mind right now that I'm having these conversations with people. Uh, also, just to do an ad, not really an ad, but just like an upcoming appearance, if you want to call it that. Um, next week, uh, a week from the time of this live stream, so February 20th at 2 p.m., I'm doing a free webinar for the Ohio Arts Council, uh, part of their webinar series, and it's called Documenting Your Classroom Experience. So it's going to be a much more in-depth version of what we're talking about today. So if, if, this, if the topic today intrigues you, I'm doing a full detailed webinar on it next week. So that's another reason this has been on my mind. That's exciting. Is there, so you mentioned that you do an ad for it. Is this a, uh, like a closed forum? Nope, it's free. It's free through Zoom meetings. So if you go to Whoa. the link link in the show notes, um, I will. It, it's it's a Facebook event that it'll take you to a link to it. But I have I have a direct link to the Zoom meeting, so you can uh, register for it if you want. Oh, that's fantastic! So, nice. So it's yeah. it's not just like a like a tease, and you know, creating a de creating demand for future product to be determined. You can actually go to this event. That's awesome. You can actually go to this event. Yeah, and I just thought this would be a way for me to uh, take some of the thinking that I've been doing about this webinar and bring it to the show as a way to like sort of adjust it and tailor it a little bit to the leaners. But specifically, the the webinar is aimed at teaching artists, so people who are doing school visits or developing workshop uh, series. How do you package that up in a way so that you can put it in front of of a potential hosting organization and they can just look and go, oh, okay, yeah, you're hired, right? Not to like how to make like a, a, a compelling sales pitch, but more like how do you package up all of your competence and all of your classroom experiences and all of your ethos and philosophy and turn it into something that is easily readable and digestible by somebody to like, like facilitate easy and quick trust with a group. Oh, that's wild. So it's, it's uh, a couple of different audiences. It's, it's, um, well, it, let's see, it's, it's a directly addressing the artist who may be dealing with institutions and also students that these institutions connect you with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neat. That's yeah, so really, really useful. I, I, I hope it will be. Uh, I was really, I was really glad and uh, grateful that they reached out to me to ask me to do this because it's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And it wasn't until they asked me to formalize those thoughts into a, a webinar that I was like, oh yeah, actually, like I've worked really hard on this <laughs> and, and bumped into a lot of walls in my last 50 years of doing this stuff. And like, it'd be cool to be able to make it easier for somebody else to, to dive in and do it. Because the more people advocating for arts, the more people will believe in the arts and it'll be easier for all of us to make a living at the arts. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Oh, you, you're selfish. Wait a minute. 
this is the agenda that's come out. Yeah, actually, I think it's fantastic. So like, and I've benefited <laughs> a ton from uh, from this too. Where I remember, like, I mean, it's uh, ten years ago or so. The the um, the up fair, mm -hmm. and that's where I connected with you and did did sort of um, so my first pre presenting of a workshop at a at an event that you were uh, part of the the leadership of. And yeah, you you do have a process of of sort of you know, investigating and, and, uh, you know, encouraging and nurturing and all that kind of stuff to see like, well, what do you have available and how could this, you know, and, and sort of, you know, meeting the artists where they're at, like you, you do a lot of work in, in that sort, sort of onboarding of someone who's about to provide something to an event. So yeah, packaging that up into a workshop, you know, with mm. it, the related ex things that you've done. Phew, that sounds, it sounds awesome. <laughs> so with that said, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> All right, so um, just I thought it would be useful to very, very quickly, like less than two minutes, really talk about what do you mean hosting organizations? So um, a lot of the people who listen to or watch the Lean Twerk cast are practitioners in some way. They draw, they, they code, they create vi things to communicate visually, and then some of them try to share that information, that knowledge, that experience in other places, uh, whether it's working with libraries, schools, what other kinds of institutions have you and I worked with in the past? Like just to give people a sense of like the broad span of the kinds of places you can share this experience with an audience. Uh, well, different um, different stages of the whole educational spectrum. So, you know, schools like uh, you know, elementary, high school, universities. Uh, sometimes hybrids. Like I, I, I taught uh, twelve weeks of web design for uh, a high, a certain um, like arts focused high school that was actually uh, being hosted within the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. So mm. it's kind of a whole few different stakeholder institutions there. Um, yeah, and um, events, uh, for sure. Lots of different venues, um, different yeah, audiences. Like, like festivals, conferences. Um, you know, I'm going to the Toronto Comic Arts Festival this year, and they do an educator pre conference. A lot of these festivals do A2CAF, does the same thing where we have a day before the show. Here's a opportunity to do some professional development sort of programming. Um, you're already coming in for the weekend anyway. Why not avail yourself of some? extra you know leveling up in your life um so things like that uh, comic cons i've presented at comic cons in the past like salt lake city comic con um detroit area comic cons um and then yeah like i've partnered with other advocacy groups like art serve michigan seriously chelsea to do school visits in conjunction with you know like some grant funded organizations like in the case of seriously chelsea it's like a national endowment for the arts uh grant pays for a lot of the work that i do with them um, or even working with other smaller local organizations like game start in ann arbor i worked with them in the past to develop some programming where it's a it's sort of like an after school program that teaches kids coding and de uh, development. And then I came in to teach like a visual component. How do you do character design and how sure. can you take these characters and bring them into your game kind of thing? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Like, yeah. So specialized educational um, uh, businesses that may be focused on like STEM and steam or game development and design, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yep. There's a few of those locally here too. Um, let's see. What was another one you mentioned? Art centers, right? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's uh, like enrichment centers uh, for people of all ages, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's a um, that's a common type of venue, right? So so there's lots and lots of places you can go with this, but the thing is, is that uh, this is this is something I I find that I do as a natural reflex, but I I don't know. I, I'm not going to put a, a value judgment on whether it's a good or a bad thing that I do. It's just neutrally speaking, this is something I do as a reflex, and I think it's actually served me well, is I never assume when I walk into a room that anybody in that room has the foggiest idea of what my job really is, right? Um, decades of people saying, oh, you make comics, that sounds like fun, what do you do for a real job? You know, it, it has, has conditioned me to, to, to believe that... Um, Okay, people have like an idea of drawing comics is sort of like too close for comfort with Ted Knight with a cow with a pencil in its mouth kind of thing, right? Um, it's it's something silly, it's something cheerful and joyous, but the understanding kind of ends there, right? Um, the procedure is invisible, and and 
you know, that that's understandable and natural. And so I don't I don't walk into the room going like, oh, you idiots, you have no idea the amount of effort and pain and toil and suffering and genius that goes into what I do, right? It's like I, I walk in going like, okay, well, they probably don't know. I'm not going to talk down to them, but I'm going to try to bring them as close to understanding what I do as I can in as gentle and inclusive way as I can, right? Which means I'm trying to get them to trust me. I'm trying to get them to build some kind of trust so that we can have a real um, collaboration or conversation in that, for that matter. And what that means is if I go to an art center, and there's one just down the street from where I live here in, in Columbus, and it's like, I'm not going to walk in and go like, hey, uh, this is like the whole thing is like, do you walk into a place and go like, you guys hiring? You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just open the door to go problem solved mm, right here. This guy. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Yep. Cause like, I don't know. Well, first of all, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to research what kind of curriculum they're, they're currently teaching, right? What kind of sure. classes are they offering? Is, is there a gap in there for me? That's like that research you should, you should be doing. But then when I walk in, even if they are looking for comics classes, I got to find out if I'm the right fit. So I'm going to try to talk to them about like what I bring to the table as a cartoonist and try to make them see my class as clearly as possible based on the way I present that information. Now, what does that mean? A traditional way of doing it, and this is not, this did not come natural to me. This was, I was dragged up the hill to learn how to do this. You know, it's like I'm kicking, screaming, going like, but I don't want to write out this stuff, you know. I, I just want to do it. I just want to go in and perform. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to build some kind of document to establish what the plan is so that we can envision what it is. And and these are what are called, the teachers who listen to the show know what this is. It's called a lesson plan. Let me pull one up on the screen. Here's one of my older lesson plans. And what a lesson plan is, is it's sort of like a, uh, a outline or promise of what's going to happen in the room. Is it what's going to happen in the room? Maybe, maybe not. But this is the plan, right? Like we talk about this on the show a lot, like, like plan surviving contact at the ground, right? Um, so um, I thought maybe very quickly... I can just go through the component parts of how I construct my lesson plans. And then in the second that half... That's very useful. Mm -hmm. And then in the second half, we can talk about um, like how you might unbox some of your teaching experiences to find what where those where those pieces could go in building a lesson plan, okay? Because like, I was teaching bef uh, for years before I made my first lesson plan. So it was like, so it felt like it was reverse engineering something. It was like put, putting rules around something that I was figuring out sort of naturally in the room. And, uh, but like once I did it, I realized, okay. And then, and then when I put that in front of a potential hosting org, it, it, it facilitates the conversation so much more easily because it's, it's chunked all the information out into like, What's this thing about? Where's it going to happen? Well, let me just go through the. the well, pieces. yeah. Well, it, this is a nice, uh, nice sort of um, like boost because, in a way, you had a huge advantage to create your first lesson plan after you were teaching. So, like yeah. going back and examining something that actually happened as opposed to being just guessing at, like, well, first yeah. lesson planned and first class and haven't taught one, right? Uh, yeah. That's really hard to unpack. That's the whole, I don't know, building a, a uh, let's see. It's 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 kind of a recursive problem, right? So mm -hmm. this is this is nice. So hopefully other people can you know get, get sort of a, a boost where in some extra context for how they might create a lesson plan uh, because of the kind of experiences. It's still, I still think no matter what, it's going to be easier to create your second lesson plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. But this will be a yeah. I, I I do a warm up exercise in my classroom where I have the kids um, draw from memory where we just stare at an image for two minutes and then they have two minutes to draw it. I take the image away and I and I do three rounds and I tell them the first round's gonna suck. What you make is gonna be terrible. You're gonna hate it. You're gonna want to burn it. You're gonna want to cast it into like a nether world. But the second one's gonna be not too bad. It's gonna be pretty okay. So stick around. You hang hang in there. It's gonna be great. Um, but I'm not saying your first lesson plan is going to suck, but I'm just saying like the first one is always going to be like a little bit clunky. But in the second half of the show, let me promise this too. Even if you've never done this before, Rob and I have constructed some prompts to give you to say like, even if you've never taught, if this is something you're just doing in your studio on your own, we've got some prompts to help you pick apart what you're doing to generate a lesson plan. Um, so, okay. So let's go piece by piece. Uh, so the first piece of my lesson plans is the title and description. This is just l literally setting expectations about what's to come. Um, 
you may notice this in a lot of talks and presentations that often they will front end at the front and say, this is what we're gonna do today, right? Uh, but one thing I like to look for, especially if I'm working with schools, um, or if I'm working with any other educators, if there's any other educators in the room when I'm doing what I'm doing, I try to hint at some kind of possible crossover with curriculum-based content. So is what I'm gonna do, does it, does, is there any way that this might be applicable to something else that the teacher's already doing? Um, because that, that is another way to like win trust really fast, right? It's like, oh, okay, well this, this belongs in my classroom. Um, and then the second piece is purposes. So the purpose you could think of is just like establishing what's the primary learning activity? What's the one takeaway you want the students to achieve today? What is the one, the one bit of thinking you hope they do? Um, and then also est establishing like why are you doing it in this way with this group, right? So in the case here on the screen, I've got like to begin a, with a low risk activity, students will discuss instead of drawing. Um, this is like a teaching term risk diminishment, like try to find like the lowest risk entry point so that the, the people will feel comfortable and excited about leveling up incrementally, right? So it's like establishing the primary, lear primary learning activity and who it's for and why you're doing it this way. And then we get to what's the process. The process is what's gonna happen in the room. What's the procedure? What are the steps to doing the activity with the students in as much detail as you possibly can do um, in terms of actual events happening, right? Uh, and another thing I like to put in there, both for myself and for potential educational partners, is proposing some questions that might be posed in the classroom. So this is a prompt for me when I'm in the room, like to, to sort of have like already preloaded uh, a bunch of thinking prompts. But in case, I like to try to think of my work, my school visits especially, as can I make this something that's replicable? Can I make this something that like their teaching changes after my visit and, and what I do reinforces and equips this teacher to work with students with different learning modalities, maybe more visual learners, right? Um, now I'm giving them some, some resources to begin investigating on their own or maybe even just using my prompts. That's fine. It's, it's free for them to use. And then finally, or not finally, uh, almost finally, penultimately, we have extensions. And um, this is based on the fact that when I was doing a lot of my, my, my training as a teaching artist, which was a 10-week course in Detroit back in like 2007, I went into rooms with very different needs. Um, different needs in terms of here's a room where these kids are all very fluent in comics and I don't have to explain why panels are different sizes. There's rooms here where these kids have never taken an art class and now I have to do a lot of uh, adjusting the content to meet them where they are. Um, so you think of an extension as like uh, uh, paragraphs or prompts to say like if you have a more advanced class or a more, um, uh, what, would I, what would I say, like a class that needs more catching up or a class with just like more uh, unique needs, how might you think about this particular activity in different ways? How would you extend it out to reach um, the, the, both ends of the spectrum from where you're standing with this particular lesson plan? It's then, um, it's nice yeah. to build in that where it's it's you're starting to to see your own material as something that has more of an intent behind it, but isn't necessarily like a literal recipe that's followed exactly the same way every time, because yeah. the different you can have assumptions in your activities like, oh, we're going to share our work and talk about it, and you could be in a group that um, that may not really work for them. And all of a sudden, there's there could be different paths to the same goal to get that same learning, um, an, an equivalent learning experience. So yeah, like just I, in general, being ready for that is a is a, uh, a useful practice. I agree. I agree, and I think I think it also is a great reminder to you that it is not you are not the primary. Um, mover in the room. You are part of a system of movement in the room. And that system of movement involves the group that you're working with. Um, and so you can't just walk in with this one size fits all thing and say like, well, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you guys going along with this thing? Right? Uh, mm -hmm. Being able to be flexible and um, adaptable to the room and, and knowing having the confidence in your knowledge base or like your skill set is as a, a practitioner of this particular art that you can move around all over and say well maybe you guys aren't into all acting out a scene and doing a performance in front of one another but maybe maybe if i write a bunch of prompts of big feelings words on the board you guys can all draw a bunch of headshots ex uh, exploring different emotions on your own piece of paper that nobody else can look at right depending on 
you know what what the what the room feels like. And then the last one that I offer is reflections, and this is prompts to get the students and teachers thinking about how this activity changed them. Um, the whole purpose of doing a workshop or event is to, and this, this is going to sound big and lofty, Rob, but this is something I really believe in. And this is a conversation we at Kids Read Comics, the organization that puts together A2CAF, we literally have this conversation internally. It's like, um, we are in the business of changing lives, right? When I work with students, I i don't have any, uh, you know, sort of quantifying um, success metric on how much I change a life, <laughs> right? I'm not saying like, oh, I change lives by this percentage, but I know that because the way I approach it and because the kids show up and they want to do it, something changes after our meeting and something should change after our meeting and hopefully it's for the better. And so this is a prompt to say like, let's think about that for a second. Um, so asking yourself some questions and maybe some prompts for the students at the end. Um, something I used to do a long time ago when I would do like weekly visits at schools is that I would say at the end, like, Hey, I'm, you know, this is our last time together. I got to go to a new place. Um, but this new place I'm going, the kids are kind of nervous about drawing comics. They don't know if they can do it. So I'm wondering if you could help me out by offering me some advice to give those kids, you know, and then all the kids will start telling me the things they learned in my class, but it's as if it's their knowledge, you know, it's like letting them own their learning. Um, and so it's, it's, it's maybe partially a trick, but it's also to like reinforce this idea of like, look at what we did together, right? Um, so, and, and I don't think anybody who's ever watched or listened to this show before is ever going to be surprised that, uh-oh, Jersey and Rob are talking about reflecting on something. I actually, I was surprised. No, I wasn't. <laughs> uh, no, it's, I was, I was actually just kicking myself from where I was like, darn. I haven't worked that into a workshop in a while. <laughs> it's uh, that, you know, some kind of, of um, yeah, the, of owning your learning, reshaping it, describing it for others and whatnot. What a, what a great way to, to sort of you know, like deeply relate and connect. And um, yeah. See, and then, I mean, that has a lot of interesting side effects too, because it's like, well, now you can describe this to, you know, if someone asks you how it went, if the organization's like, here's a feedback thing, or if your parents are like, well, um, what'd you do today? I, there's, there's practice and, and um, connections. And, and, and by doing it as a group, you're, you're helping them all contextualize it in their own way, but then offering that to one another in the group, right? So it's like, what'd you sure. do today? Well, we drew some shapes. Oh, what does that mean? I don't know. But then this other kid says, well, these shapes mean this, those shapes mean that. Oh, that's right. It's reinforcing it from like, like your peers helping you reinforce what just happened in the room so that you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Collaborative more, reflection. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I like to do uh, whenever possible at, at the end of my sessions to, um, you know, remind them that they've been through a journey of some sort. You know, I, I always, I always say the same things. I say like, thank you for your hard work today. I don't let the kids leave without a high five. And I always tell them that, or I try to get them to reflect on what do we do? What happened here? You know? Um, so, so anyway, the, the whole thing about lesson plans is like just chunking it out, right? Chunking it out into title purposes, process extensions and reflections. How do you get to those things? Well, we'll talk about that in the second half. What do you say? It sounds excellent. Okay, great. Uh, okay. So in about, uh, minute and 30 seconds, Rob and I are going to explore some prompts to help you find out where to plug in that information, even if you've never done this before, even if it's unpacking your own work. Before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible, and those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lena Tuart is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in me and Rob and what we do and you want to help make it more sustainable, you can do so for as little as a dollar a month, and actually, you can cancel at any time. You can just sign up for like a month and do like a one-time monthly donation. Stick around for that month, though, because there's like a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes for you to, to enjoy. And I want to thank five people who have been uh, supporting us on a regular basis, on a monthly basis, ongoing basis. First up, Becca Hilburn. Thank you, Becca, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Becca Hilburn all over the internet at Natto Soup. And Chris Watkins. Thank you, Chris, for supporting the show. And Catherine Sugru. Thank you, Catherine. You can find Catherine on Twitter at Kat Sugru. That's K-A-T-S-O-O-G-R-O-O. -O -O. And Ashley Knapp. 
supporter of the show since day one. Thank you, Ashley, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Control Alt Lee. And finally, another big booster of the show, Carrie Goldwell Billick. Thank you, Carrie. It means a lot to us. You can find Carrie on Twitter at, well, all over the internet at Mushin Girl. And you can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art where you'll find all the shows we make as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners. Patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to all of you. It means a lot to us. It does. It's so awesome. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay. What am I going to play? What is going to be the the transition music for the next round? That's right. Just, just trying to keep Rob awake, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i may not be jumping around but i uh i don't know i'm ready I'm ready <laughs> okay I'm that ready music indicates unpack some learning experiences well i i was grateful that you came in and plugged in into the notes like how you would unpack some of your experiences for teaching because this is another thing that we're going to talk about in the second break is that you do a lot of facilitation and coaching so you make stuff you make video games you know guitar fretter uh this panda needs you uh but then you also teach people how to do it through a video game construction kit underwater tomato ninja edition but then you also do coaching facilitation which means you spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, I do this thing, I do it effectively, how do I pull it apart so that somebody who's never done it before could possibly do it? Um, how do I uh, take even facilitation, what I'm doing when I'm facilitating a room? What am I actually doing in there, right? Like, because what you're doing, I, am, I imagine, this is the way it is for me, is like, when, when you've been doing it a while, it becomes instinctual. Right. Like I, I can feel in the room like, OK, that kid is going to need a little extra energy in a certain direction. I don't want to over praise them, but I don't want I don't want to coddle them either. I want to push them, but I want to push them in a really supportive way. And you can feel it in the moment. You can feel like, OK, that that's what's needed here. That's not immediately apparent what's actually what decision making process is happening in your head when you're feeling out those moments. Right. So, oh, yeah. And, and there's a tension between. Uh, feeling comfortable with having a style and having a, uh, well, well, having a plan and that there's going to be a, a performance of that plan that doesn't, it doesn't look the same. It's not like, oh, there's a, like metaphorically, if this were an album version of a song, if a workshop is a song, it's like, well, and you go to the workshop and you, you hear it performed live, you're like, mm, that doesn't sound like what was on the album. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, it needs to be something different because of all the things, all the things, the, 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 the space, the organization, the people present, and whatever people, everyone's bringing that day at that time, at that moment. So yeah, there's a lot of, uh, really, <laughs> practice helps you uh, feel comfortable and trust yourself. And yeah, you will get um, your own sort of um, attentive habits. Yeah. Um, where like, yeah, facilitation, uh, one of the goals is to, um, you know, just try to trying to bring as much of the creative possibility and brain power that could possibly be connected and integrated at the same time from everyone present. And that is, uh, I mean, that I don't really necessarily even put that in the plan. It's almost like this is a, a little bit of a motivation read between the lines um, way to um, a more of a way instead of a what or something, right? I, just trying to put it to words, but that that comes into the practice too. And I don't know if, like, you know, just us mentioning it right now is is enough clarity. But uh, no, it's no, kind but of that's its own topic, yeah. right? Where like <laughs> actually there's it is. a planning, and then there's the performing, and the yeah, there's and a this lot is more it. this is more about the planning, knowing that. And again, I keep going back to what my my, my teaching Jedi master said to me was that like when I did, did all this hard work making a lesson plan and a curriculum and they were like this is great you know you're not sticking with this right and I was like what are you talking about um and, <laughs> this this was my safety yeah this was yeah my my road that I'm building brick by brick step by step and we'll get from here to there <laughs> precisely and, and there will be zero problems <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, it, it, it's it's, but it's it it is a safety in the sense that it gives you a place to start, and then if if things go off the rails and things don't go in that direction, it's like okay, well, let's figure it out. But at least we have some place to begin instead of just like walking and going like okay, what we're we gonna talk about anyway. Um, so the first prompt. So I think we're going to get to like through the planning. I think we're going to talk a lot about the performance too. But like the, the in terms of planning, here's the first prompt: What's the primary thing you hope the students will learn? Or if you haven't taught before, what is the primary area of focus in making your art that you want to communicate? So like essentially, it's like what's the thing you're doing? What's the main thing you're doing? Uh, whether it's the main skill that you're trying to get the student to learn through this activity or the main, like if there's one thing in your art that you wish you knew when you were first starting out, what would it be that you'd communicate? So I'm wondering, um, Rob, if you want to start with, so I want to pull up on the screen, you have this workshop on Skillshare called Drawing User Journey Maps to Design User Experiences, Gather Ideas and Collaborate. Um, if you could talk about like how you unpacked that to and how you think about that in terms of like what are the main things you're trying to teach through this particular kind of workshop um there's kind of a, a, a the step before that for me is the what in the world do i pick to talk about what do i what do i even choose yeah and i i meandered and explored and went through my own sort of creative cycle to narrow down that thing and i landed on uh user journey maps because as you can tell from the very verbose title of that workshop, they're incredibly useful. And it's one of the things that I feel that as I've collaborated with fellow designers and have worked in teams of all sorts of different backgrounds, um, business skills, technical skills, design skills, and all this stuff, that user journey map thing was a, a technique and um, like my own adventure that, that in applying these techniques, I'm like, I think I have some useful things to say about this particular thing because yeah, I've, in, in performing and being a, a, like a, a user experience generalist and, you know, someone who's done, uh, like research and wireframes and the, um, I mean, and, and I've even been a, an engineer, right. I, I do code as well. I don't emphasize that, but you know, whatever. I've worn a lot of hats. So, I mean, I, what do I even talk about? Right. And it's that, yeah. I think there's a signal in your own background where you're like, Hmm, that I, I saw that as I was being of service in that way, that this is what I, this is one of the possibilities that I think has a, uh, a spotlight on it because of my experiences in applying. It. it wasn't just sort of checking a box that I know I can, I could totally teach about that thing too, but this one stands out. Anyway, do you, do you have that as well? That, well, sure, sure. And and what's what's funny is is that any one of these topics you can drill down in a, in a variety of different angles. So like like the example that immediately comes to my mind is a topic we talked about a lot in the show is making mini comics. Why make why would you choose that as your 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 subject? Well, I do it a lot. You know, I find it it provides me a lot of value in a lot of different ways. Ask me about it, I'll give you a list. Um and it's a self-contained thing that you can do in a couple hours to explore any different thing. Like I've used the mini comic as a vessel to explore like, hey, let's let's do an exercise on composition and visual narrative. Okay, so how can you frame up shots? At, on page five, you have to have a moment where somebody feels like they're being squeezed in emotionally. Uh, on page seven, they have to be released emotionally. What is that, how do, you, how do you stage your shots to look like that? Or it could be as something as direct and simple as let's just get through making a mini comic to prove that you can do a thing. I do this all the time in my classes, my, my multi-week classes, like the first day, all we're going to do is make a mini comic. I don't care how you do it. I, I'm not going to tell you what the subject is going to be, but by the end of this eight, uh, you know, this, this, uh, 60 minutes to two hours, you're going to have a finished thing. So that now in week two, when I say, here's what we're doing, like, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You did it last week. You made a mini comic. Don't tell me you can't do it, right? So it can be used Ooh, you to- You laugh evilly. <laughs> I, I did have an experience. I did have an experience where a kid was really pushing back me hard. And I said, this smile is only so thick. <laughs> it will break. You don't want to see what's on the other side. And then I laughed like that. <laughs> um, anyway, but yes, so like you could pick a topic and then there's like a whole bunch of different ways you can go down. So when you yeah. chose making a user journey map, I'm wondering what things you were thinking about. What are the primary learning activities in this? Yeah, workshop? so in, uh, infused with that sort of this is what I, well, I know is um, can be valuable for others. It was like 
user journey maps. Uh, I know that if I facilitate, facilitate this learning experience well, you'll see how you can have this, this simple visual narrative that connects many different narratives, right? So there's you starting with, you know, so being user centric, you could be you exclusive all of all other, other things, but what if you included them? What if you brought the engineers in? What if you brought all, you know, like different business areas and whatnot, and you looked at the entire journey of before, during, and after they're using your product or service. Um, and all of a sudden you're seeing the world in a, in a, um, a wider possibility space beyond this like transaction, right? So uh, you'll get layer multiple perspectives. You get to put yourself in the point of view of the user and organize your ideas with that as like this focusing thing because wow, meetings and agendas and everyone's got their different disciplines and specialties. What if you can get past those goals and find the common ground and st- they more focused on the common crop, that kind of thing. So I get to sort of uh, pitch and, and teach about um, this, the, the bigger collaborative benefits. Um, so you get a wider context of ideas because of that. Um, and then it's a great uh, exploration tool. Then you can, you can keep adding to it and whatnot. So um, it's, yeah, it's a very useful thing for whatever you're planning to build or improve. Okay, so like I'm hearing uh, collaboration and um, perspective gathering are two of the, like the, the primary things you're looking to mm-hmm. uh, enhance, improve, accomplish in the room. Um, yeah, not limited yeah. to that. Not, of course, not limited to that. But like that's like what I'm saying, like when that's, you talk about. That's a great distillation, right? So it's yeah. extra, you know, really distilling that down. It's, yeah, co- um, collaboration. Yeah. And, uh, um, hmm. I think it's, it's a port. It's um, let's see it's for the audience to experience a very portable representation of such a um, like a simple way to represent a lot of complexity in a bigger system. There you go. So um, approaching complexity in a system with a simple approach, a simple and grokkable, understandable approach. So again, this comes back to this idea of like, I'm talking about like building trust with hosting organizations. It's like being able to say that so that they can go, and and maybe their mind might go into some different places, um, but the, you, you're getting the big idea there and how you approach it in the room is a different thing altogether. The planning is different than the performance, right? The performance is going to be made uh, 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 affected by the people who show up. But the planning is getting the hosting org to say, oh, this is the value you're bringing. This is why this is valuable. Well, why is this valuable? Well, we live in a complex world full of complex systems, and we don't. I don't think that we do enough work to adequately address the complexity in a way that our human minds are capable of. I've developed this thing to help us engage with complexity in a simple, approachable way, right? I love it. Uh, I'm stealing it. <laughs> um, this, yeah. So this is this is this is before benefits. I. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. What? So like it's like you could talk about the mechanics of your activity. You could talk about the the um the sort of elements of the art and whatnot. But that's more the features. If like what we're talking about here in this exercise is as far as describing. Um, like what people will take out of this. It, it's more of a benefit. So if you've ever had to frame something, like if you, you know, um, any kind of sales description, what have you, it's the, um, the benefits are, are the why that, that mm-hmm. and uh, how people's um, lives are improved with that thing you're offering. Yeah, and, and the why is not self-evident. Um, something that I think is really important for us to remember is that what's, uh, what is immediately apparent to a master is invisible to a student. Um, There are things that I see written on the walls in 10 foot letters that are on fire that my students just cannot see yet because they haven't been there. They haven't experienced it yet, you know? Uh, and And I think the same way when I'm approaching a hosting organization is how can I talk about this in a way that will bring them to me rather than me being like, what, you don't get it? What are you, dumb? No, they're not dumb. And you're dumb for saying that. (laughs) (laughs) That's the, sure. That's, that's the sales path that we, we tend to avoid. Yeah. 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 You can, you can, uh, that's the, uh, the aggressive stance, you know, alpha weird thing that is yuck. So. Yeah, it's it's yuck because it, it, I I think it's brittle and and utterly unsustainable because you have to keep working that angle to keep people feeling cowed and I'd rather make people feel like they're empowered and like they're a part of something, that's sustainable. Um, so the second prompt, 
Uh, what are, now this is going to seem weird, but like, you know, we do all this distilling down to like, what's the core idea of what we're doing? Then ask yourself, at least this is what I ask myself, what are some incidental things that might be learned or explored in the room? So the distillation could come across at times as like, well, now you're being reductive. You're really reducing my art down to this. No, I'm not. I'm asking you to like make it manageable so that it is something that we can explore in an hour to two hours because you've spent a lifetime doing this. It's unfair for you to expect anybody to approach it the way you're approaching it in two hours. It's unrealistic. It's unsustainable. It's, un it's, it's, it's unfair. So now that we distilled, what are the other things in this activity that you might accidentally learn. They weren't part of the actual agenda, but what are some other skills that might come out of, uh, or deeper understandings might come out of doing this? So again, let's go back to making a user journey map. What are some like unplanned things? I think I wandered into this space that, that yeah, I didn't, when I was listing those things before, I sort of just went raw. I went like primary, secondary, everything. So many things. I love journey maps. Woo. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I kind of hit that list a little bit, but, but um, so the, you know, the, the primary ones are the, you know, being able to facilitate that, that's shared, you know, um, narrative that's really, you know, detailed from different perspectives, but then um, using that, that framing a thing over time is powerful, right? That's mm -hmm. like, even, even this, like planning your, your learning experience, if you think of it as a user journey map <laughs> and like what, you know, what might people know before they, they enter this and then what kind of experience do you want to have them? Like, like what's the progression there? It's just, a, it's, a, it's a very portable, powerful tool. So you might notice like, oh, hmm, let's, you know, uh, thinking of things from another perspective in a sequence of time, that's pretty darn useful. Yep, you'll, you'll just have that in your pocket. You'll be able to do that with whatever you want. Um, and then, uh, the, the common ground thing where be, and being able to visualize that and all of a sudden everyone seeing their voice and their voice is next to someone else's voice and it all makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. That's really nice in any organization. And I imagine anyone listening to this can think of lots of meetings and situations where that harmony wasn't present. It, it, it could sound like a lot to ask a teaching artist, but like something I take very seriously when I'm in the room is I'm teaching a skill, but I'm also beholden to teach social and emotional learning as well, regardless of age, right? Because I've taught adults and I've taught adults who, when I ask them to put a pencil in their hand and put lines on the paper, they literally looked me in the eye and said, why are you doing this to me? And I'm like, first of all, <laughs> I, I, you aren't locked in here. <laughs> I don't have any kind of weapon to cajole you into doing this and thing. It wasn't You're here. Like you put a sign out that's outside that said, like, I don't know, uh, whatever, uh, free free sandwiches, right? Right. Or, right. <laughs> surprise. You, you came here on purpose, right? Yeah. You, and you knew what you were in for, right? But uh -huh. but like so, but th that points to okay. Here's somebody who has some. We all walk into a room with our own emotional. Um, development, baggage, um, you know, predisposition, alignment. Mm -hmm. And part of facilitating and working with a room is working with that too. And can you look for incidental things that through doing this activity, will people level up in other ways? So like when you talk about perspective taking, the moment you start talking about perspective taking, you're teaching people emotional intelligence, right? That's not explicitly in the title of your workshop. And it's not even in the description of your workshop, but that is a incidental byproduct of exploring this thing. You know, that's a really good point. I, I think I can do better with the, these, uh, these secondary things because you're right. That sort of um, a capacity for social learning and emotional learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to, I, I need to expand uh, m like uh, my, my own listing of benefits and, and uh, uh, additional ways my classes are useful that's that's really really nice and, and this i mean i don't want anybody to think that I, I came to this this knowledge like really easily this is for like 15 years of doing this from like talking with school administration from getting feedback from parents like parents who show up at, at the end of my class and see what's happening and they give me their reflection i'm like oh yeah i guess we were doing that you know uh and and also um having to explain to um you know like grant grant funders you know how is this improving the lives of the students beyond the activity in the room like that somebody who's who's you know giving us grant funds is going to want to know that 
Um, and so if I say like, well, they'll have an advanced sense of understanding of composition and general art principles. Well, <laughs> that we all agree that's good. But like the dad or mom who's sending the kid to college, are they necessarily going to be like, well, that's where my money's going. But if I can say like the students are going to do peer review. And this is going to teach them collaboration. It's going to teach them like some emotional resilience when they encounter the fact that they their work isn't communicating well with another student. And then it's also going to teach the students to help each other, build each other up so that they can achieve more together. Um, you know, that isn't explicitly in my lesson plan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's, a, it's an incidental byproduct that I can use as potential uh, information to in, uh, inform the reflection session or the extension session. Um, or even, or even into the procedure for that matter. So, um, that's gold. Thanks for that. Yeah. Well, no problem. Uh, next prompt. Uh, we'll get through a couple more, and then we got to get to like our second break in our uh, two minute exercise. Um, I think this is a worthy question to ask yourself: Is does the activity skill building benefit the student in other non obvious areas? Well, we're learning comics. Well, we're learning user journey maps. And that is, those are the walls around this room. Nothing that we do in this room has any application anyplace else. For 15 years, I have had parents come to me going like, wow, my kid really loves drawing comics, but I don't think there's any money in it. And I really care about my child. And I'm super nervous because I don't understand what goes into this field. So <laughs> is there are there real jobs in your field? Like, do you actually have a job? And I'm like, okay, well, you know, and I've spent years explaining, like, you can go into character design, you can go into video game design, you can go into uh, concept art for like film and television, you can go into storyboarding for film and television, you can do a lot of things with this skill set. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in defending why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, why are you even here? Are you a fraud? Are you just trying to bilk us for money to like give our children a, a, a dream that will go nowhere? No, <laughs> this, 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 this is a real thing. <laughs> You know, maybe maybe they want to be a writer, and by having them actually understand how to visually construct a scene, they're going to be better at describing it in words and visualizing it in their heads, so that they can you know explore it, uh, you know, with with uh, prose instead. There's a lot of ways this can be applied. So, I think a little bit of creative thought can go a long way to say like, okay, well, how if you as an artist benefited, like, what other skills have you noticed you've gotten better at as a result of? doing this you know like i do this the, the the memory the drawing from memory exercise which i do with my students i tell them like you know having a really good memory benefits you not just in drawing <laughs> you know it's like you're in school right now i know you guys have to like recite a lot of stuff so having a better memory will probably make you better at those other things we have to do like reciting of things so so let's go back to um you know can you think of any non-obvious areas that would get leveled up through taking user journey maps uh, one of the things, it depends on how you facilitate the, the sort of map creation, uh, mm -hmm. because if you're, if, if you're doing this in a live group situation where you're, you're collaborating real time and you're assembling the map or critiquing or improving a, a map that you brought beforehand, whatever, that's, that's, a, there's a lot happening there as far as, um, doing live collaboration and being a facilitator of that. That's, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But then if you, if you do it sort of as, um, as evidence of 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 research and it's and it's conveying insights and whatnot and and you're you're sort of doing research interviewing people and whatnot and then creating that the user journey map as a, an expression of this this knowledge then you're practicing interviewing and uh doing you know qualitative research so practicing interviewing also makes you a better um dinner party companion it makes you better at networking <laughs> yeah that's you know, I, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, this is something I can say that um, when I started doing the Comics Are Great podcast, which was different than Art and Story. Art and Story was a podcast where it was really just like art buddies talking about art. Comics Are Great became explicitly an interview show. So every week I had to not only get somebody to interview, but then I, I would research them. I'd like read their blogs. I'd read their Twitter feed. I'd read their books. And I would try to come up with like, what are some themes I'm noticing here with them? What are some things that like they're saying that like triggers my imagination and I can push on it? And Chris Schweitzer, uh, comic book artist, said the most flattering thing that's ever been said about me, in my opinion, about doing podcasts. He said, Jersey finds some central idea. I'm paraphrasing now. He finds some central idea in your philosophy and pushes on it and makes you defend it. And like, and I, I don't think I ever did it in an argumentative or aggressive way. I think I just did it with, I don't get it explain 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 you know and i would find like three or four different lines of questioning to get them to explain their their position their point of view um 
But boy, oh boy, does that make you better at going to a conference and being able to walk up to somebody and strike up a conversation with them, right? Um, so I would argue that like, yes, that that is one of the things you could point at with user journey maps is that leveling up your interviewing benefits your career in ways you can't even predict, right? Organizing information, right? Making a user journey map means that you're gonna have to like find discrete chunks and categories for different parts of a process. So like just being able to understand that things have a process, right? Um, that, that is a really good point. Like it, it is in, in a, in a way it's teaching a, a systemic, a mental model for systemic thinking. There you go. Boom. And Boom. Oof. Winning trust with a hosting organization. Right. Hmm. And that, that, and that, that might not get into, um, the, you know, the advertisement for the event, but it makes the people who are funding this thing feel more comfortable in the level of expertise that you're bringing into the room. Right. Yeah. I mean, because if you've, if you've done this kind of um, examining and analyzing of the, of the thing that you're offering, and especially if you're doing it through a little bit of reflection on, on performances of like, well, what did I, I, you, you got to expose the thing you made to a new audience and got new perspectives. Uh, How did that, what came of that? And all of a sudden you're adding these new layers all that stuff then helps with the, you know, like you said, back with relating to the organizations that would host you because now you've got more inroads and connections that are, I mean, it's credible. It's not just sort of saying like, well, it, you know, it adds to overall, you know, feeling solid about the circumstance of your art. Well, it, it also, you know, shrug, I mean, if, right. It's, it's <laughs> no, you've got a, 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 a real story that you can, you can, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a strong rationale, basically. It's a strong rationale. And if you do some research on the hosting organization, you can find out what are the things that, what are their, what's part of their mission? Can, can the incidental learning actually contribute to their mission? So I think about this a lot when I'm doing school visits, I actually talk with the administration. I say like, okay, I'm coming to your school at this time of year. It's going to be in the spring. Is there anything that's happening in your school district in terms of curriculum based content that I can tap into that I can re reinforce and bolster because I want to be an asset to the the teachers. I, I use that language. Like I want to be, this isn't just about promoting my book. This is about being uh, of real service to the students and an asset to the teacher. So if there's any subject that you feel like is going to be a primary place of focus in the curriculum, let me know. I'll find a way to move my um, presentation and bring some of the content toward that direction. Um, so like, like one school... One school was like, the, you know, we're, we're doing research projects now in like sixth grade, you know, and like getting the kids to understand how to do research is tough. I'm like, cool. So I went and talked to the school librarian. I'm like, okay, what kind of resources do you have here, right? I know this is sound like a little bit of extra work, but man, oh man, does it make a difference in your presence in the room, right? Everybody there is rooting for you. <laughs> And then, like, then when I could point to the librarian and say the librarian's name, so like, you know, go to Mr. Copy and Mr. Copy can help you get this information. That's what their job is, you know. Um, I'm reinforcing that they are surrounded by resources there to empower them and help them. And it's not just about me being the the celebrity for the moment. So that's really, uh, that's a great sort of service of your teaching, right? That's a... Uh, and it and it it feeds into the material. It feeds into the sort of the content and the performance. But yet, it's the um, there's there's there. I guess there's space between the building blocks where what can glue this together better, and, mm -hmm. and inherently involving the audience yeah. is going to be useful. I mean, I, I, this I do want to say like this. This is partially born out of a hang up that I have is that when I was a kid, I don't feel like my teachers growing up did a really adequate job of explaining to me why it was important that I know these things. Like I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to make comics from the age of like 10 years old. Like this is all I want in my life and everything else. You got to make your case algebra. Explain it to me. How's this gonna make me a better comic book artist? You know? <laughs> and I really had that kind of like, I don't want to say defiant, but I had like a, a sort of, um, I didn't come to their side of the table easily. I because unless they and then my geometry teacher he made a case. He's like, "Well, you're gonna be drawing perspective, you know. You're gonna be making objects look like they're three dimensions. Probably help you." And I was like, "Okay, well now I'm here. Let's go," you know. Um, so like I feel a strong desire to do that. So like I don't you know for better or worse, this is partially coming out of a, a hang up that I have from my own upbringing. But um, 
but I, I still think it's what important. a great way to channel a hang up, right? So you're <laughs> you're, you're bringing a you're bringing it into um, doing. I mean, this is the whole thing of uh, well, it's to me, it's 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 being human centered. It's involving your audience and doing some uh, an act of co-creation, which inherently makes a product more, um, you know, approachable, re relevant, easier to adopt, um, probably have a longer, longer impact and all that because of its, its relatability. It's not just this, wow, that was a really bunch of flashy nuance, super fun, laughed my butt off that that guy showed up and, and really brought it a month later. Mm. But a month later, hey, wait a minute. Um, I know I, I got this resource. I don't, I don't know, remember exactly how I remember this resource, but you know, you're part of this overall reinforcing learning machine and, and the, mm -hmm. the agenda of, of like um, being of service to the students, being of service to the organization and all that stuff. That's uh, yeah. Being um, let's see. Uh, it's very UX -y of you, right. Which I think of as being human centered and systemic minded. I, I had this conversation recently with somebody where we were talking um, about, you know, like working with different teams. And I and I just said, like, we were talking about um, an experience we had ages ago with uh, a team member who was very protective and defensive about what they were doing. And I said, oh, there's more than one way to be indispensable. And that's to, like, just show up and do the work and be of service. And then, like, everybody will want and need you if you show up and, like help everybody work better together, right? Like that's my personal philosophy anyway, is like, I don't need to protect my intellectual property. Like don't record my talks, you know, or anything like that. Because like, uh, I mean, I get that why some people would do that. If like, that's the way, the primary way they're making their money. And if their talk doesn't change a whole lot for the audience is more presentation based. I get it. But like mine changed for every audience and I'm always basing it more on what the actual, like what the audience explicitly states as a need. And uh, I think what makes me indispensable is that experience is going to be unique to them every time. That's how I define my indispensability. Anyway, um, a couple more prompts, and then let's take a, a, another break. Um, and we don't have to go into like d explaining these prompts too much because I think they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, there was that part of the lesson plan called procedure. So, in other words, can you take whatever skill you're trying to teach? What are like three to five things that you do in doing that? I'm sure there are at least three discrete different things that go into doing things, whether it's sculpting, whether it's character design, whether it's fixing a sink, whatever it is, there's probably like a couple different milestones that these, this is the procedure of things that need to happen. Okay, well, now you've got a procedure, at least that you can unpack for a learning experience. What are the three things you could have your students do or five things? And then ask yourself like, okay, if how would I explain this to somebody who has absolutely no knowledge of this thing versus somebody who maybe has a passing knowledge of this thing? What are some things that you find, like when you think about your own development as an artist or as a creative person, UI, UX person, what were things, the stages where you felt like, okay, I have, I've read a couple books. I know some of the language. Um, maybe I'm not using um, jargon just yet, but like, what could you bypass to bring people in faster if they're a little bit more leveled up? Or how would you change the activity altogether to be a little bit more like uh, higher skill based? And then um, how has your teach how is how has teaching your craft or subject changed the way you think about it? That reflection is valuable because that gives you some potential um, wayfinders for people who are engaging with it for the first time. Now, because you can look at how you've changed as a result of teaching it, maybe you can offer some insight or some leading questions to a, a teacher or group of students to say, like, how might you have been changed? How, how, how would you look at yourself now? Um, and yeah, I, th I think that's a lot of good material to yeah. dwell on. These questions are fantastic. So they, like each one of them, it's just sitting with that as a prompt and give yourself two minutes <clears throat> um, <laughs> to answer that prompt. And that's that's going to give get you traction, even if you're sitting there facing this thing of like, gosh, I've done this thing for years and I think I can probably do some teaching on it or I've been asked to teach on this thing. Um, put yourself through those prompts. And, and it's, it, it doesn't have to come out easily or whatever. Just let something rough come out and start to answer these different questions because that will be a catalyst to clarify your thinking about the teaching experience. And it doesn't have to come out all at once in a specific order. You can get the pieces and start to assemble it together and then clarify it over time. That's totally okay. And I, I think you have some great questions here to, to work through a process to, 
to, well, like you said in the section, it's, it's unpacking your learning experiences. I, I think, thank you for saying that. And, uh, but I, I think it's, it's fair to acknowledge the fact that you've done so much skill building and leveling up to do the thing that you do at, at like a natural state. Like the thing I see to my students all the time is like, when you get on a bike, you don't go, where do my feet go? What happens now? It just, it feels like it's a part of your body. It feels absolutely natural. What you're doing when you're doing that is so complex. To, so to, to break it down into, like, how are you working out how to balance? How are you working out how to do different speeds to different things? If you could do tricks, how are you doing all that? You know, um, breaking all that down into the procedure and to, into the basic knowledge you need to do each individual leveling up, that is a lot of work. So it's okay if you aren't awesome at being um, clear and explicit about it in in words and in talking. I, I tell my students all the time, I consider cartooning my first language and talking my second language. And I'm not always successful at explaining things verbally as I am with drawing it. Um, so it's okay. It, I think that's, that's worth acknowledging and, and trying as best you can to be comfortable with that, that it's going to be a little bit of a process. Well, maybe start simple, pick one thing, one tiny, tiny discrete part of what you do, whether, even if it's just like, how do you pencil sketch? That's a hard thing to learn. Like, you know, like how do you how do you learn to, the difference between like doing a finished drawing and doing a pencil sketch to lead to a finished drawing? Boom, you got a whole world to explore there. That's an 8-week course. <laughs> <laughs> so All right. Yeah, that's that, that's great. So, right, it, it's it's okay to invest. It's okay that it's it, it can feel different and you may not feel as skilled or ready to do that, but I think you can find uh some you, you You'll, you'll become ready through yeah. unpacking it. You did when you became an artist. So mm -hmm. <laughs> going back to my first metaphor with the mini comic, you already proved you could do it. So don't, don't, don't come at me with your I can'ts. Anyway, um, all right. How about we take another break and then we will come back and look at what we're, our two-minute practice sessions for the week. Sounds wonderful. Great. Okay, so we'll back in two minutes with that in uh, for our two minute uh, two minute practice segment. And but we got to thank some more people who make the show possible. Those people are us. We make the show possible. The thing that I work on that I hope you will check out is the Kids Comics Awards for 2020. Um, every year at the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival, we have an award that we give out to um, cartoonists who make books for kids. But here's the twist. Kids nominate the books and kids vote for the winners. And the open nomination form is open now at a2calf.com slash KC Awards, Kids Comics Awards. And the winners are given these really cute Lego trophies. Um, so if you have a young person in your life who enjoyed a book that came out in 2019, then go to uh, a2calf.com slash KC Awards. There is an online ballot where they can enter 10 or more of their favorite books from 2019. There's also a printable ballot that they can print out and write on and then just mail it to me. There's a P.O. box listed on the ballot. So um, if you're more comfortable with doing it that way, we don't collect any information other than first name and last initial and age because we're just trying to make sure that, you know, we're, it, only, only kids under the age of 18 are eligible to nominate their favorite books. Um, and then later on this spring, there'll be the final ballot compiled from all the nominations by the kids. And then the kids get a second round of voting from May until June. And the winners will be announced at the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival, June 12th through 14th, 2020. So once again, that's a2calf.com slash kids KC awards. If you know anybody who makes comics for young people, tell them to tell their constituency that they can vote for them. Um, that's how some people got on the ballot last year is they, they mobilized their fan base saying, Hey, you know, nominate me. And they got on the ballot and then they got votes that way. So a2calf.com slash KC awards, Rob, let's talk about some, some things you made the where next journal and the workshop that goes along with the where next journal. Yeah. So a lot like the drawing user journey maps, um, workshop slash class that uh, we've mentioned a few times in this episode. I've got a few other workshops out there. And one of them is one that I co-created and co-facilitated with my partner uh, and collaborator in lots of things, Kate Shield Stenzinger. And yeah, that's called um, <clears throat> Goal Setting Using uh, Design Plus Storytelling. That is a pre-recorded workshop that helps walk you through a journal we also created to support this. And while well, we're supporting this activity of doing um, 
goal planning in a creative and approachable, but like different, you know, using just different skills to sort of get the ideas out to being a little more analytical in some activities, being more looking at it as a story in others and in, in, in yet even others to just help with reminding you and relating to all this planning and stuff that you did coming up with like a portable word or, or phrase either way. To, to just, you know, carry with you and remind you um, in, in whatever way you want to relate to your, you know, your rich goal planning experience. And this whole thing is just six extra, uh, exercises that, that accomplish that kind of uh, a, a useful goal planning experience, like the ones that, that Kate and I have been practicing for a couple of decades now. And it's, uh, yeah, it's available at Skillshare. If you're already at a, a Skillshare uh, user, fantastic. Or you can get two free months by signing up. Look, look for uh, Rob Stenzinger, go to Skillshare.com and you'll find that workshop, goal setting using design plus storytelling. Or you can go to my Gumroad store with these two different links. You can get the free version of the journal, which is 10 pages, or you can get the full 30 page version of the journal at gum.co slash WNXTJ. You can get the workshop, which is the video that walks you through the journal, lots of fun examples and stuff and joking around. And uh, a, a, well, a workshop learning experience like we've been talking about in this episode at gum.co slash G-S-U-D-S. G-Suds. And if, if uh, the last thing we want to tell you about is the Lena Tork Discord. Yes, we have a Discord server, which is basically a forum where you can hang out with fellow leaners, talk about different things that you've been working on. There are three public channels that you can participate in, and there's three private channels that are only for people who support us on Patreon. And we have been posting our two-minute um, practice sessions in the Discord. It's been a great place to post our work in progress and get some feedback on it, talk about commenting on past episodes, suggesting topics for future episodes that we would like this thing to be of as much service to you as possible. So if you'd like to suggest some future topics for us to chew on, um, you can go to the Lena Tort Discord. We will have the invite link in the show notes. So thanks to everybody who has been interacting with us there. It's been a lot of fun talking with you. Mm -hmm. it's, it is a lot of fun. So uh, we, we, we use that for this thing that we're about to talk about, the two-minute practice sessions also. Um, and we're working on turning this into a little separate um, segment and what have you that, uh, that maybe, who knows, maybe there's a separate feed. We'll see. This is an experiment, work in progress, um, surrounding the practice itself. Uh, all right. We ready to go, to, go there? Yeah, we have, let's hit it. All right. All right. So why do two-minute practices? Well, these two-minute practice sessions are about practicing small things frequently whatever you end up choosing. So two minute practices are what we use to explore all kinds of different habits and things related to being a creative human being working to succeed in business, art and healthy lifestyle. So things can add up over time. You could have a work of genius or whatever uh, happens, happens in the, in the, in this small action session and it can become something large, but whatever it does, even if it's, you throw, you throw it away, you have that experience that you carry with you this practice of doing things and that is a worthwhile pursuit in and of itself. And the recipe to do these practices is the idea is you, you pick something that you want to practice, something that's low pressure, and you have this curiosity, some, some need you want to explore, a strength you want to strengthen further, or probably a new thing. Who knows? Well, give yourself a way to time yourself, just two minutes. Two minutes is very affordable. It's, it's a, you'll, you'll, once you get into this, you'll notice two minutes is enough to do a lot. Uh, but it's not that... Uh, big of a bite out of your day. So you give your practice a try, you celebrate that you did some practice. And if you want, you can take a note how it went and move on with your day. So uh, do this for maybe seven days in a, in a row. So do it six more times, uh, two minute practice session each day. And on the seventh day, look back at it and, and, and make a choice about, uh, you know, how do you feel? Where do you want to go next with this? And how'd that practice go? And is it time to pick a new one? Mm -hmm. So what do you think about our latest practice? Do we have some reflection on that? Uh, so what we, what I chose to do, it looks like you did too, um, mm -hmm. was drawing a D and D creature daily was, uh, now I didn't get to do it daily. I had some days that kind of ran away from me and then all of a sudden like I'm sitting up at like 1am going like, ah, I forgot to do it. Uh, but I did do it a number of days this week. And I mean, I, I posted some, I posted one on Instagram actually. Um, I did mm -hmm. like a, one of my first ones was a beholder. Um, 
but I mean, I did more that I posted on the um, Discord later on in the week. I was like uh-huh. a Kenku, and um, I did uh, yesterday. I did an elf on a mountain, um, and and like the, the the parameter I was trying to set for myself was like I've got like this multicolored pen with like eleven colors on it. It's it's one of those Centos pens. Have you seen these in stores? Um, oh, so it has uh, some. Each color has a scent. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I, I, I was when I was younger. I was fascinated with like those Crayola crayons that actually had scents on them. So as soon as I found this pen, I was like, "I'm it's mine." Um, they all smell pretty much the same. <laughs> they don't smell that different from one another. But um, like the black one isn't leather, like it was with the Crayola crayons. But anyway, it's like, okay, well, I've got this eleven color pen. Let's try to do a post-it note drawing of a D and D character, which I don't draw all that often, um, and try to like work in, you know, using different colors um, mm-hmm. to create the design. Reflection for me was that when I started raw with just, I got the pens, I got the pad, hit the timer, go. Um, it didn't happen. It wasn't as fun. And I didn't feel like it was as uh, joyful of an expression of my drawing ability because I was trying to solve the creative problem of what angle am I going to use? Am I going to be close? Am I going to far away? I'm, I front-ended all of that thinking into like the first 15 seconds of the drawing. And then it's like, oh, now I'm just racing the clock. But when I took just a couple breaths before hitting the timer to like, just visualize it. Just visualize it for a few seconds. Like that's, this is how the beholder one went. I was like, okay, I see it in my head, go. And then I started drawing it and that one came through great. And I feel like for a doodle, it's a great doodle, but it was a great reminder to me that when I take the time to stop and visualize what I'm about to draw, I tend to do a better job of it than if I just try to like, all right, I've got two hours. Let's just keep going. You know? Um, so that'd be my reflection is that a nice gentle reminder to myself to visualize. But the cool thing about it is that it came at very little cost. Cause like, I don't care about this sticky note drawing of an elf on a mountain. It's just a doodle. But anyway, what about you? Uh, I wonder if, I don't know if I connected with as much meaning with the practice, but I had just, uh, I just had enjoyed myself. So I, mm. I ended up for convenience. I did, uh, I did a thing where, I wanted to to do the D and D creature drawing because that just sounds fun. I like I like that I like that idea. I've got to see these old books on my shelf. I haven't played in ages and ages, and uh, but I do enjoy looking at them for for inspiration once in a while. Like when, when in a creative challenge context, especially because I'm like, hey, this stuff really is sitting pieces and parts of it are in my brain somewhere. Anyway, let's look through this. Ah, oh, it's fun to reconnect. And uh, so perfect excuse for that. And a double perfect excuse because I was like, I'm picking Spelljammer books off my, <laughs> off, my, <laughs> off my bookcase because I bought those things and none of my friends wanted to play. They're like, d d is space? <laughs> Shut up, go away. And I'm like, ah. So anyway, <laughs> I got to reconnect with Spelljammer. <sighs> so that was fun. And uh, just, just raw enjoyment. Uh, and then uh, I, I did mine. I, I don't have them close at hand or whatever. I did them in, uh, on like eight and a half by 11 paper. And I, I would pick a pen. I would pick one pen and just go for it. And so sometimes I would use pens with, uh, with a thicker line or a thinner line and what have you. And that was, you know, part of the experiment. Uh, rapid drawing, very little. Like I think I, w- w- based on your reflection, I feel like the ones where I did think a little bit uh, before I put a line down, uh, they had, they made more sense mm. where, cause I was trying to do like sort of my own pose, take whatever on this, on a creature or, mm-hmm. or, uh, even a scene where there's some kind of space pirate with a, with a, um, a, a, a little treasure chest, uh, over his shoulder. And he's like, surf, he's like, I don't know, like, no, she's standing on an asteroid with a, almost like smirking at a mind flare. And it's just like, well, <laughs> I'm going to turn that into something. I'm going to make like a, like a space surfboard that looks like a pirate ship that this, that someone like that in, in really rough two minute drawn cartoony forms on. And so it was just fun and silly. There you go. That's, that's what yeah. I did. And I like low stakes, fun and silly drawing, even though a lot of them don't turn out very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's that's part of the the mission of this thing is to like decouple us from this whole idea of having to make something that is, um, you know, that you can show to the whole class at the end. Um, 
Yeah. Although, I mean, I like one of the things I've been enjoying about the Discord is that I can share the work in a way that's non-public, you know. So I, I like sharing it there because, like, these are the people who are like, I don't have to do a whole lot of like bringing them up to speed onto what I'm actually doing here. So Good when I have point. like this you crude drug, two minutes context. Hey, I, I still can draw well, but I'm also doing this <laughs> other thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could imagine that pressure um, for the Instagram post, but once in a while something can come out of it that actually yep. does look really good. So that's yeah. great too. Yep. So, all right. So are we picking, uh, are we got to pick right, a, so, yeah. What should we, what should we do? I, I want um, you to take the lead on this one this time. I, I kind of like blurted it out ahead of time last time. Yeah, that's great. So let's <laughs> see. All right. I will, uh, I will pick <laughs> something here and uh, just, just know that the, so we like to pick something as a featured thing to practice. There's lots of options out there to practice. If you're just starting out, um, one of the things that we did when we first started out is generate ideas of what to practice. Mm -hmm. Or if you feel like it, take this prompt and just go with it to try what's it, what it's like to do some creative thing in two minutes. Either way, whatever works for you, that's great. Um, and then if you, you want to learn more about this whole thing, uh, we do have a whole episode about you know this 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 uh, as a topic, uh, episode 301 of Lean Into Art, where we discuss lots of options. So um, as far as a featured practice on our minds this week, you can tell I, what, just from what we, I, we said seconds ago that um, I'm just picking this out of thin air. Um, let's do a, let's do a music thing. So uh, uh, let's say, make some noise for two minutes on whatever the heck you want to make noise on. Hmm. All right. I have several musical instruments in my home. I will pick one. Make noise for two minutes. All right. Consider it done. And then everybody else can pick whatever they want or, go, or play along with us, and you can uh, share your experiences in the Lean Into Art Discord. So. Yeah. So there you go. Let's, let's, uh, hopefully we can, you know, keep on enjoy, enjoying this kind of thing. Uh, and, and remember to keep it low stakes, right? So two minute practices are about practicing small things frequently and, uh, pay attention to it if it, if it's not feeling good and, and steer away from that. Find, find, find a fun thing that, that's, uh, nour nourishing you and nurturing you to practice. Cool. All right. Well, I think we did a podcast. So thank you, Rob. Thank and, you, we do this show live on twitch.tv slash lean into art, uh, usually on Thursdays, though we're switching to Wednesdays here and there as my schedule necessitates. And we uh, collect it as a podcast at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash lean into art. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of lean into art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger, also of lean into art.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>